Speaker, I move that the second report of the Economic Finance Committee on Embedded Networks in South Australia be noted. Okay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In June 2019, uh, Mr Speaker, the Australian Energies, Energy Markets Commission, or AMAC, submitted a new framework to then Council of Australian Governments containing improved protections for consumers in embedded electricity networks across most of Australia. Despite wide national support for the proposed framework and a packet of legislative reforms, COAG and its success the Energy National Cabinet Reform Committee has not progressed the framework. On the 31st of March 2021, the Economic and, Economic and Finance Committee resolved to investigate into embedded networks in the light of the delayed action on the framework and to identify issues that the South Australian Government could address within its jurisdictional powers. The inquiry received 14 written submissions. A total of seven public hearings were held between the 26th of May 2021 and 27th of October 2021, with 16 witnesses appearing before the committee from regulatory bodies, electricity companies, community organisations, retirement villages and peak bodies. Mr Speaker, for the benefit of the House, I would briefly provide AMAC's definition of an embedded network, which is a private electricity network that connects multiple premises to the inter interconnected grid by a parent connection point on a distribution or transmission network. Put simply, Mr Speaker, these are the electricity networks commonly found in multiple occupancy spaces such as apartment buildings, shopping centres, retirement villages, caravan parks and some residential parks, like some in my own electorate, Mr Speaker. People in an embedded network purchase electricity outside the national electric electricity market through off-market sales, mostly from a third-party retailer. A range of witnesses and submissions demonstrated that collective negotiations on behalf of multiple tenants or property owners in an embedded network brought significant financial benefits. The committee heard that some consumer protections were enshrined in regulation that carried the weight of law. However, many of these were, were proven to be more theoretical than practical. The committee heard evidence of a two-tiered system that significantly disadvantaged embedded network consumers. The inquiry encompassed testimony from tenants, retirees, property owners and commercial leases. A disproportionate number of participants in the embedded networks were vulnerable consumers experiencing or at risk of experiencing financial hardship, particularly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, which occurred after the AMEC lodged the framework with COAG. These consumers were more likely to face disconnection debt or lack of access to supports than the national energy market electricity consumers. The committee even heard evidence that embedded networks consume, sorry, the committee also heard evidence that embedded network consumers were ineligible for some state government electricity concession programs. For example, some could not produce a required national metering identifier, also known as the NMI, because many embedded network meters did not incorporate them, while some third party services were that referred consumers to hardship concession schemes could not understand that a client might not have a direct account with an electricity retailer. The longer the proposed reform frameworks remain off the national agenda, while the cost of living increases, the greater the financial gap may widen for these vulnerable consumers. The inquiry encountered an existing framework that sacrificed consumer rights in favour of liberating network owners from heavy regulation. Many consumers and small business found the complicated rules and regulations difficult to understand, leaving them vulnerable to landlords or other in positions of power legally able to negotiate contracts on their behalf. The committee heard widespread agreement from all regulatory bodies that the current framework was no longer fit for purpose. The inquiry found that the technical structure of embedded networks circumvented practical implementation of some consumer rights. For example, Although freedom to choose a retailer was a basic principle across South Australia, it was not a reality for embedded network consumers. And that is certainly the, uh, my experience, Mr Speaker, uh, in some cases in my electorate. They could face significant practical barriers such as inability to access the meter, still having to pay a network access charge to a regional retailer even, even after leaving, or paying for expensive upgrades to infrastructure that would outweigh any savings. Any savings. The committee heard that consumers in residential embedded networks could not approach the electricity and water ombudsman of South Australia unless their network was registered for the scheme. Although this is a requirement of their licence, the inquiry found that only half of all known embedded networks in South Australia were registered with the ombudsman. 
This left half the state's residential embedded network consumers without an independent dispute resolution mechanism. The lack of recourse was demonstrated by residents from two retirement villages who shared their experiences in a committee hearing. They described the village management locking them into multi-year contracts without their knowledge. Some residents who installed solar panels had to pay higher bills under the new retailer. The residents approached multiple avenues for redress, including the Ombudsman and the South Australian Civil Administrative Tribunal, sadly without any success. Mr Speaker, most evidence supported the AMEX changes to the framework, although, although the committee heard concerns about the transition process and older legacy networks that could be forced to upgrade their infrastructure beyond manageable costs. The caravan park industry provided evidence that the burden of meeting current electricity regulations was dissuading parks from providing residential accommodation, pushing them towards providing only tourist accommodation that required fewer requirements and less costs. During the inquiry, uh, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, AMAC highlighted to the committee that the new framework did not intend to impact smaller operators in this way and that a draft of new framework could rectify the issues highlighted by the Caron Park industry. Given the current uh, affordable housing concerns across the state, the committee considered improved communication between operators and regulators and ultimately implementation of the AMEX new framework to be cr uh, crucial. The inquiry investigated potential South Australian solutions independent of national regulatory frameworks. The committee examined South Australian legislation pertaining to Caravan Park residents and owners, tenants and landlords, shop leases and lessors, retirement village residents and owners, property owners and strata corporations. It found no mention of embedded networks, exposing significant gaps that enabled consumers to sign contracts or leases without any knowledge of an embedded network on their premises. This prevented prospective renters and purchasers from making a fully informed decision at the time of their financial commitment, leaving them exposed to the consequences of participating in an, un in an embedded network. The committee, the committee compared South Australian legislation to the legislation from other Australian jurisdictions, finding that Victoria and New South Wales had incorporated embedded networks into their residential tenancy legislation and associated documentation. Their examples provided models for South Australia to replicate with minimal effort to potentially great benefit. The committee has made nine recommendations in its report to enable consumers to enjoy the economic advantages of embedded networks while mitigating against the disadvantages. The committee supports AMAC dismantling the two-tier system of consumer protections. The committee recommends that the South Australian Government writes to the, national, writes to the Energy National Cabinet Reform Committee and the Energy Ministers' meeting to endorse AMEC's proposed framework and re-establish it as an agenda item. Other recommendations include reviewing all state government electricity concession programs, strengthening eligibility provisions for embedded network consumers to lodge disputes through the Ombudsman and encouraging the Australian Energy Re Regulator to take on reports from any ineligible customers. The committee recommends minor changes to the framework's transition process and better communication from AMEC to small network operators outside the electricity sector. In addition, the creation of an easy-to-read information sheet about embedded networks will give South Australian consumers the knowledge they need to make informed decisions before committing to a lease or a property contract of some type. Mr Speaker, the South Australian Government has sufficient remit to make legislative changes outside the regulatory framework. The committee considers that embedding consumer protections in property-based relationships would be the most direct way to drive change. To that end, the committee recommends amending state legislation to ensure potential consumers are fully informed about an embedded network before making a binding commitment to renting, leasing or buying a property. The final recommendation is to make actual changes to the residential tenancy agreements, retail and commercial lease agreements and property contracts suggested in the report. Mr Speaker, the committee believes the recommendations represent a pragmatic uh, but at the same time achievable course of action. On behalf of the Economic and Finance Committee, I would like to extend my gratitude to the representatives of regulatory bodies and other organisations, business and groups that submitted evidence to the inquiry. I want to highlight the contributions of the residents from the two lifestyle SA villages and thank them for the gen generosity of time and evidence provided. Finally, Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the current Economic and Finance Committee and the members of the previous committee in the 54th Parliament for their hard work on this inquiry. Shadow Treasurer. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, I rise today to speak on uh, the Economic and Finance Committee's uh, report into embedded networks in South Australia as one of the, well, I think, almost the sole remaining uh, member of the Economic and Finance Committee from the uh, previous uh, term of Parliament and the, the previous chair. This was something that I was uh, reasonably close to and, and think is a, a space that we can clearly do better for the people of South Australia and clearly the consumers, most of whom are, are unwillingly uh, laboured with a set of arrangements in regards to their electricity contracts and embedded networks that they are most likely not aware of prior to signing agreements or contracts. Can I begin by thanking um, those organisations, businesses uh, and representative bodies that gave evidence to the committee process and inquiry uh, over the period of the last parliament. It was an important piece of work and we thank them very much for their contribution to this report and where I think we've landed on what is a very complex uh, and difficult issue um, is a set of recommendations uh, that are pragmatic and that focus on ensuring that the customer is as well informed as possible uh, when they enter arrangements in a range of areas. Essentially for those who are unaware, uh, an embedded network is where uh, a particular property uh, has a head meter uh, with direct connection to the NEM uh, and then a range of child meters under those that don't have direct connection to the NEM. So uh, essentially those customers, whether they be in apartments uh, uh, on caravan sites, uh, on uh, uh, part of a small business strip shop or within a shopping centre, uh, each of these uh, customers, while uh, being provided with electricity, aren't necessarily afforded the same rights uh, as those that have direct access to the NEM. These arrangements uh, have become more commonplace, particularly on the East Coast uh, through Melbourne and Sydney, as there has been a, a considerable uh, increase in apartment buildings, uh, student accommodation that has been uh, developed over the last decade or so across the East Coast and this is something that uh, those that were members of the committee were aware was going to be an increasing issue in South Australia. We obviously uh, understand uh, both as a committee and a, as a community that this is evolving technology. It's something that wasn't even uh, directly considered in most likely circumstances by uh, previous energy meetings from COAG groups three or four parliaments ago. Uh, it's something that has come forward that does in some circumstances provide considerable savings for members uh, of embedded networks where there is the ability to provide scale, there is the ability to leverage uh, new technologies uh, in uh, environmental uh, and new ways of producing electricity through solar panels and other means. So by no means was the committee saying that embedded networks are bad in all circumstances. In some, they most certainly do deliver significant cost savings and benefits to those that are members, but sim uh, members of an embedded network, but simply that there needs to be more transparency uh, and upfront information provided to those that are entering these arrangements so that they are fully aware uh, of the commitment that they are putting themselves and the situations that, that they are putting themselves in. Um, as I said, uh, those that came forward to the committee to provide evidence that they had in some circumstances unwillingly become part of an embedded, net, embedded network without um, knowing it come from a wide range uh, uh, and representation of our community whether they be through rental contracts in apartment buildings, through sale contracts uh, as a purchaser of an apartment, whether they be somebody that moved into a retirement village uh, without knowing the arrangements for uh, their, their, uh, their village and how their electricity is managed, but also a range of small business owners who were keen to have greater control of their uh, energy requirements and situation and arrangements. So we do know that we can do better and the majority of the recommendations that were provided by the committee uh, are largely in the space of ensuring that consumers are presented with this information at a point in time where they are entering agreements 
that they should be fully informed of the arrangements that they are entering in. So whether that be at the point of signing a rental contract, whether that be at the point in time uh, of inspecting a property uh, that they wish to potentially purchase, whether that be at the point in time that they sit down with a retirement village to sign a contract, or whether they are a small business looking to uh, rent a space in a set of strip shops or a, a shopping centre, that they should, at that stage, be fully informed of the arrangement that they are about to enter into. We do know, as I said earlier, that this is going to be more and more relevant as uh, time moves by, as there is more development uh, across Adelaide, as we do see more and more small businesses setting themselves up. So the committee does see the recommendations that were put forward as sensible. Um, we do, again, wish as a committee, or did wish as a committee, to have this put back uh, on uh, the COAG Energy Minister's Council's plate so that they are aware of these issues and still actively considering them. Uh, in particular, uh, there was an oddity around retirement villages, some uh, within driving distance of the Adelaide CBD, who in part of the reform that had been proposed and that has moved forward, um, were almost uh, captured unintentionally uh, in the way that the arrangements had been moved forward. So there is a sensible uh, solution to that that the committee has been uh, has raised with the, the COAG Minister, uh, Minister's Council as well. Again, uh, I don't wish to, to labour the Parliament's time on this today, but um, I wholeheartedly support the recommendations that were made. I think they're sensible and pragmatic, and I urge the current ministers with courage of those particular areas to consider the recommendations that the committee has put forward so that we can have some sensible changes that put consumers in a place where they are fully informed of the arrangements that they're uh, about to enter into. I think that's the least uh, that we can do for, for these people. Um, again, we're not saying that embedded networks are bad. In some circumstances, they do provide significant benefit to those that are members of them, but transparency is key uh, and is something that I think all members of this parliament are keen to achieve when people enter contracts. Um, can I finish by thanking uh, sincerely uh, our secretariat at the time who had prepared um, this report and inquiry. It was not something that um, those particular members had been au fait with. It's a very complex uh, set of um, legislative arrangements across multiple jurisdictions and with um, bodies that sit independent of government as well. So to Joe Hocking in particular, thank you for your diligent and hard work uh, over that period of time in preparing this report. Uh, again, we've reached a place where there's consensus and bipartisan support for these recommendations and I urge those ministers to uh, get on with reforming what is some pretty simple changes that will provide the people of South Australia some practical um, solutions to problems that exist today. So uh, I wholeheartedly support uh, the committee's report and urge others to do so too. The member speaks, he closes debate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think I uh, just concur with the comments made uh, by the member of Colton. And again, I just uh, reaffirm my support for the work done by the previous committee. Most, was, most, I think all the work was done by the previous committee. Uh, and I think what the recommendations would um, present some important reforms to help the most vulnerable in our community. Very well.